Um, so uh, any thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'm anticipating your question. Um, I, the thing that struck me so much about the advocacy sort of for me that I think I need to do um, a better job of is taking kind of um, clear notes with somebody who is having, um, you know, who may be dealing with an issue. Because I, I feel like I take notes a little bit randomly um, and I could see like ordering them in the way, ordering some questions in the way that you are um, kind of presenting the, the advocacy stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that's, I'm going to sit down and kind of think about what that would look like, but that was really helpful to kind of think about. Yeah. I'm wondering, I have it so ingrained now, I don't really think about how I know what questions to ask or what the flow of the questions is. I don't really look at anything anymore when I ask the questions, but I definitely did not start out that way. But I created little evaluation sheets for every part of the body. Meaning like if somebody comes in and says their neck hurts, I had a sheet I could just pull out and it was had all the neck stuff on it. Uh, and oh. questions to ask, like, so it has a subject. The way that we write notes for PT, um, it, we call it SOAP notes. I don't know if this is redundant, you guys can tell me if it's not mm -hmm. useful. Okay, so we call it a SOAP note. In, in the, the S stands for subjective. So subjective means when they come in, I ask how they are. I always ask how they are. And I always ask what their pain is like, or I ask what their pain is like at the, this moment and how it was since I last saw them. So specifically, how did you feel right the day, 24 hours after our session? Like with that 24 hour block, sometimes I extend it to a 48 hour and I extend it to a 48 hour question when it, I know they have a disc or back problem that I'm not sure what it is or neck, right? Because the disc is gonna speak up a little later. Sometimes even muscle, if they work really hard with their muscles, the muscle, um, you can up to 72 hours after an exercise program, you can have sore muscles show up. So I don't know if you've ever like worked, worked out really hard and you're fine the next day, but then the day after that, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, my muscles hurt. It hurts to squat. It hurts to lift my arms up. You know, like sometimes it takes 48 hours. And for some people, it's actually 72 hours. So I usually ask though in that question, what was it like the 24 hours after? And if it was longer than that after, they might say, oh, that was fine, but the next day, and then that can still be referred back to work we did together. Or you can say, well, what else did you do in your day? Was there like, what do your days look like? Did, and I've had people say, oh yeah, I was so sore after our session. I said, oh really, you know, that's surprising because I didn't think that was that intense. Yeah, well, you know, I went home and I'll ask, well, what else did you do that day? I went home and, you know, we had these, we had to get the garden done because we were having a party the next day. And so right there, I'm like, I don't think it was our workout. <laughs> I think it might've been the garden and then the party. So, you know, you can, but getting a good grip on, um, in that subject of how are you feeling today? What is your pain level? Um, how, how were you after the last session? And is it, has anything happened in this past week that you think I should know about? So those are like really good subjective and that would be your S part of the note. Then you have the objective part of the note and the objective means anything that I observe objectively. So if I notice that the person's walking in and they have a little limp, I'll write that there. It looks like there's an increased limp. Um, when, or let's say you do footwork, for example, and the patient complains of pain you could put that either in as patient or client complains of pain doing footwork in your subjective, or you could say um, noticed ankle eversion while on the foot bar had a hard time keeping parallel positioning, uh, looks like they're uh, not even on their legs, looks like they're having difficulty raising the shoulder up, things that you see that you might that you might think are important later that might be worth looking back at the next time they come in. So that would be sort of the objective. Also in the objective section, we always write down what exercises they did. So in the O of the SOAP note would be, if I wanted to list, I don't know if you guys all list all the exercises you do with each client, but that goes in that O section of the note. And then I write down each exercise. I write reformer and I just list 
in abbreviated terms, like everything I do on the reform, everything I do on the Cadillac, everything I do on the chair. Um, so that would be the O section. And then the A of the SOAP note is stands for assessment. What did I feel like, how did I feel like the client did really? What is my assessment of our session or the situation? So if I, I could write there that um, patient had, um, did great in the session, no complaints of pain in the session, or I could say patient had very difficulty with maintaining equilibrium, had balance issues, was dizzy, um, potentially something else is going on. And you could even put in there, I recommended patient to go see her doctor, or I recommended um, that maybe she has somebody look more deeply into this, or I recommended that she should do her home program more frequently uh, in order to get strong, you know, whatever you assess, or you could say that um, I think the client's getting better. I think the client's getting worse. Like that's all that information that you could put in the assessment. And then the P stands for plan. So anything that you plan on doing or that you and the client agreed on as a plan, like uh, for next time. So if you had something in your mind that you didn't get to that session, um, you could say work on hip opening next session. That's my plan or patient agrees to see her doctor before next session or um, need to upgrade home exercises next session. Like that would be in your plan section. So that's just a tidy, neat little note that doesn't take long at all to write down. And then it organizes things a little bit better. Um, and then in those sections, I can try and see, I'll see what I have already written, but in those sections is where you can kind of say, what are the most valuable questions to ask in each, each section? And then maybe just have those printed on a piece of paper that you can just pull out and go, okay, I'm just gonna ask these questions. Just sort of check down those things, maybe even make a little, you have the question, then you just check it if it's fine. And then if there's something to write, you write it. You write it out to just make it super quick. Thank you, Zaina. Yeah, this is super helpful. Also, I always have to say that I have this sort of fear of somebody, something happening and getting blamed for it, and then not having kind of anything to show for what I did or have anything written. So I, um, I recommend that everything gets written down um, with a date. And at least so you have the date and then that information from that day. So at least you can say, here's what we did on that day. Here's what I wrote down on that day. And if you have a consistent list of things you've been writing down on that day, then that stands up for you a little bit. And if, if ever, God forbid, but if ever somebody came back and said you did them wrong. Um, and unfortunately I have to say that it did save me once that I did have everything written down because something did happen. And, um, and as horrible as the whole situation was, I had everything written down and I had saved emails and saved text messages which are easy to retrieve in the moment, but they're all saved in a file just in case something was ever to come back to just show that I was doing my job, you know, and that there was no negligence on my part or in case, you know, good question. Thank you for asking. It really helps me too to know what's valuable for you guys. All right. So here's a uh, client three scenario. Um, a client comes to you wanting to get strong and get her life back to a reasonable level of activity, hiking, short runs, biking, throwing a ball, and functional activities without pain. She complains of pain in her neck and shoulder on the right as a primary issue. She says that with all activities uh, she does, she has pain in the scapular region that her head feels that it is wobbly on her neck. She's been trying to strengthen for a long time and always ends up in pain with severe tension in the neck neck, shoulders, and scapular region. She has to brace herself when she drives over a bump with her car because it can send her neck and head into spasm. Her past history is as a performer with Cirque du Soleil as a primary acrobat. She was forced to stop performing because of a shoulder rotator cuff tear on one side and a labrum tear on the other. Both were surgically repaired, but since those surgeries, now 10, 10 years ago, she's not been able to be physical anymore. The neck and shoulder pain are what are bringing her in, but she feels issues with many joints in her body much of the time. So current journey. She has been to see multiple doctors. According to them, the shoulder surgeries were successful and there's no problem with the shoulders. There's nothing apparently wrong at the neck according to the x-ray that they did. She's afraid to go back to doctors because she does not know 
how to explain what is going on with her and they don't they do not seem to believe that there's anything wrong they keep telling her to get stronger she's been trying for the past 10 years to get stronger has done tons of physical therapy and her husband is a physical therapist and has no idea how to help her nothing has worked to relieve her symptoms in fact she seems to be getting worse all the time all right so she you gather this information um, and I have to say, I gather that information, not all of it all at once, uh, because she was afraid even to tell me. The, the other thing that she was afraid of um, was to talk about some of the other symptoms in her body. And she was afraid to talk about them because people have kind of told her that she's crazy and that it's all in her head. Uh, so that was kind of how she came to me very cautiously. Um, so I, she sat down, I watched her move in the studio. So I just, I think it's, I think I've said this before, but I think it's super important to, I don't always get to watch the client walk into the studio, but I do get to pick up the client from the waiting area and walk with them to wherever we're going. And even if that is in your same room, you're going to see them moving from one place to the other or changing positions for you. Just, um, if you can, I know sometimes we need a moment to turn away, but if you can, that's those are great times to observe your client because they don't think they're being watched. So you gather a lot of information about somebody when you're watching them when they don't know they're being watched because there's, they're not trying anymore. They're just moving as they would in their, in their world. And it's not that they're trying to impress you necessarily consciously. It's just that if somebody's watching you, you do something differently than you do if you're alone, right? But we get to, we can catch those windows. So this is what I did with her um, at first. I Her movement is always a little bit jerky. She feels out of alignment, has a hard time activating muscles. She fatigues very quickly, like very, very quickly. So this is a woman that I've seen in her thirties, right? The early thirties. Um, so she, she shouldn't be fatiguing. She's young, she's healthy. Every movement causes her to brace an area of her body. She's fidgety and can't seem to be still. She's constantly searching for the right position slash alignment, has difficulty getting her muscles to fire properly or fire at all. So what the heck can we do <laughs> for this person? Um, this is someone who needs time. She needs your time and she needs to have somebody who can really listen to her. Um, I don't know, how would you feel, just from the information I've given you, if that person was coming to see you, how would you feel initially? Overwhelmed. Yeah. You guys agree with that? I felt overwhelmed starting, I felt overwhelmed just watching her move. Um, and uh, so when I, when I feel overwhelmed, I just, I go try and break things down to their most simplest, uh, the most simplest way I can. So, and one of the things I know I can always achieve is really listen to what's going on. Listen and watch. I can really listen and watch and I can think. And um, sometimes I can't figure things out on the spot, but I can take in a lot of information. So it's like, sometimes I wish I was a fly on the wall. I really do. And, and that's sometimes, how I try and act, not, not to be rude, fly on the wall, but to be able to observe the whole picture of something, fly on the wall idea, right? So I almost remove myself a little bit and I let them steer a little bit until I can start to see what's going on or what's not going on in this case, perhaps that needs to be going on. So um, I, watch, uh, I watched her a lot. I never had an agenda before she walked in um, obviously I didn't the first time because I didn't know what what she, what she had or what was going on or what she was walking in with. So it that's and that takes it that takes an expert person, right? It takes somebody, it takes a certain amount of comfort in your ability to not plan ahead, because you, in this case you're not going to be able to plan ahead because you don't know what she may or may not be walking in with each time. It might be something different. Um, so my agenda was always okay. What's on your agenda today? What do we need to cover? And that's after I got to know her a little bit. Um, and then reach out to our resources. So what resources do you have um, to reach out to? 
how can you help this per this is a person who is really looking first of all to figure out whether or not she really was crazy because she was told that she was crazy and that it was all in her head but if you can see physical things going on which you guys have a really good eye for then those things are real right the root cause of all of that maybe you don't know maybe she doesn't know but there's there's definitely like if i tell you she's fidgety she can't seem to activate muscles you can verify all of that by watching her move right movement's jerky she feels out of alignment she's having a hard time activating muscles is that true or not watch her watch her do a few basic things is that true that she can't activate it she fatigues quickly that's very real at 35 or 34 or 32 a 32 year old who was a Cirque du Soleil acrobat like that's the highest level acrobat this woman was doing um Russian swing do you know what Russian swing is it's this huge swing, like, and one end is the pusher. There's a guy, always a big, huge guy on the back of that swing. And he's flying that thing. The swings are hung in Cirque du Soleil, 20 feet above the ground. And they are launching people off the, the flyer. They call it the flyer, is the person on the other end of the swing away from the pusher, who's at the top of the swing getting launched doing a series of flips and either landing in water or landing on a mat. That's, she's doing that kind of level of acrobatics plus gymnastics and tumbling plus um, climbing ropes and hanging like this. This is that woman. So this woman now is fatiguing very quickly. She can't, um, every time she moves, she feels like she's holding somewhere else. She gets stuck in a lot of positions. So. So there are some physical things happening here. So for me, if somebody has physical things happening, then whether or not it's coming from her brain, there's physical things we need to address, right? So she's not crazy. She's not imagining that there are physical things. If, if the person walks in and they look 100% normal, they're moving completely normally, they um, sometimes, and, and this is where I, sometimes somebody comes in with severe back pain they're moving completely normally. There's no stop in motion. They have full range of motion in every direction. They have full strength. They're walking totally normally. Okay, that's when I start to think, okay, maybe this is a referred pain or maybe it's an emotional pain, but regardless, it's a real pain. So um, they're not crazy if they have an emotional pain, but that looks different than this. This is somebody not moving properly mechanically for some one reason or the other. Yeah. So validate that. We can validate that. We can say, yeah, I can see you're having a hard time moving. Yeah, I can see that when you stand on your left leg, your hip sticks out to the side for some reason. And even when we try and cue you over that leg, you're not getting there. Um, so uh, yeah, I can see that your shoulder range of motion is restricted where everywhere else you're totally overly mobile. Right, so you can notice things that you would notice on any client. Um, write those things down in your objective section, perhaps, and keep track so that you can see if there's any progress. So tell me, what else would you know, want to know about this person? What comes to mind? If she had seen a neurologist. Mm -hmm. So a neurologist. Neurologist said there's nothing wrong. Um, so, has she, um, has she had an MRI? Mm -hmm. So she had shoulder MRIs. She had, um, she had shoulder MRIs after the surgery. They said she was fine. And I think she also had a cervical MRI because she was having all that kind of head pain, neck pain. And this, she calls it the rib of death in her, um, it's like the third rib down because if that catches, she just goes down. Her whole body doesn't function anymore. She can't really get connected. And she has so much pain that she's out. So she calls it the rib of death. And doesn't, she doesn't really know what starts all this going on. Um, something that is really interesting here. And, and when you see this, so these are the people, so you've been to multiple, multiple doctors nobody seems to find anything. So there's a category or a series of illnesses that fall into this category. Um, and maybe I should make you guys a list of them. 
because that's when when I see okay oops sorry I should go one side back when I see this kind of list multiple doctors surgery after surgery no problem but the function doesn't come back I'm afraid to go back to doctors because they don't know what's wrong with her they don't seem to believe her they keep telling her to get stronger her husband's a physical therapist doesn't know what to do with her like, so when I start seeing all of these things I start thinking a little bit outside of the box and the things that tend to fall into this category are things like Lyme disease, um, things like fibromyalgia, things like chronic fatigue, and things like Ehlers-Danlos, right? And that's what this is, is Ehlers-Danlos. Um, so extreme hypermobility uh, is, is exactly this. Uh, and this is, I have two clients that are on the high spectrum. One that's actually worse than her because she's already 75 um, and just struggling, completely struggling right now. Um, this client, so this client was is re remained undiagnosed, right? The, pro the reason that, that there are those list of things is because they're hard to diagnose. We don't really have a very good standard of diagnosis and a lot of doctors don't want to deal with these kind of illnesses because they don't know what to do with them. So the issues here are that, okay, so if somebody feels like, um, I was really worried because if somebody feels like their head is on, not on stable, there's a couple things to worry about there in that upper cervical region, right? Um, do you guys remember from our cervical section way back, okay, I'm jogging your mind and memories here, how the axis and the atlas sit together. So remember axis and atlas, there's the dens that goes up and then there's the C1 on top of the C2. And we have this rotational ability because we have kind of an axis and atlas to move on. The atlas holds the skull up and the axis, we have this kind of sticking up part that goes in so we can just rotate a lot. And C1, C2 affords the most rotation in the whole spine, right? We get, we get most of that rotation at C1, C2. So, but there is that transverse ligament that holds C1 on C2 properly. If something happens to that ligament, we don't get pure motion anymore. We also get a lot of motion, right? We don't get, it doesn't hold enough to just allow the rotation. So imagine if I go to rotate, if you do it with, if you do it with a um, sample of, I'm trying to think like a top or something, that's supposed to spin, but if the thing that's supposed to hold it in line while it's spinning isn't holding it in line, we then get this wobbly type of spinning um, and it doesn't get the pure motion. We get a lot of excess motion and it gets wobbly, like a top that's not right on its point starts to spin slowly and it gets kind of wobbly instead of that straight up and down. So that transverse ligament has to hold the C1, a C1 on C2 or C2 on C1. What happens in somebody who's hypermobile to their ligaments? They're too long, right? If the ligaments are too long and you try and rotate your head and that transverse ligament's not holding, you're gonna get wobble. So why, why if we want to, we could dig into Ehlers-Danlos maybe another time, but in this case, um, this, the, there's that to worry about when somebody talks about their head. The other thing to worry about is the carotid arteries right, run up the sides in the little holes that go up to your brain. So that's all your blood flow to your brain. So I always worry about those getting impinged if people have a lot of head neck pain and that's undiagnosed. So what the doctors did here is they did an X-ray of her vertical standing still or laying flat on her back supported. This is also true with people with spondylolisthesis. They do an X-ray with them totally still and they go, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. But nobody thinks to look at what happens when I, when I extend, which in spondylolisthesis, or when I flex. In spondylolisthesis, that's where we'll see that. Same thing in, um, with somebody who has a lax transverse ligament. Uh, they, if, they, nobody's taking a film of them in motion. So nobody sees what actually happens in motion. We can all look great if we're just glued to a table, right? But we don't all look great when we're unsupported. And in this case, what happens here, so she was super strong, obviously, if she was such a high level acrobat, super strong, 
And what happens when you're super strong is you can compensate for ligament laxity, right? When she had the shoulder surgeries, she lost her strength because she couldn't train. And then she couldn't get back fast enough. She kept losing strength. And guess what? She has no ligamentous stability. So everything starts falling apart. Yeah. And so that's kind of to give you what's actually going on. So here's, you know, with people, but knowing in your mind now that if you have this sort of story, they've been to all the doctors, people think she's crazy. You can watch for yourself, see what's happening orthopedically. Do you see something? Do you see nothing or do you see something? If you see nothing wrong, you can say to them, hey, you know, I'm so glad you're here. I, I'd love to work with you. This is going to be so great. Your job, but you can say to them, you know, you have great range of motion. You have great strength. I think we can take a moment, give you an hour out of your day, week, or two hours out of your week. And you're going to, I would spend some time with them, having them breathe, relax, decompress, and say, you know, you're doing so well physically. Do you take any time to just relax and rest? You know, you could start the conversation there. And then do you talk to anybody about stuff going on in your life? Like I've, I've done that with people. Do you have a support network? Do you, have you ever considered having somebody to talk to? That, I mean, people really appreciate that if they understand that you're there to help and support them. And your job in that case would be, I'm gonna give them a great hour and something to look forward in their day, to in their day talk to them about their physical goals, let them feel really good about their great work they're doing and their great body that they have and the great physicalness that they have about them. That already is a huge help. And then just slowly introduce, you know, I wonder if some of this pain ha might have to do with some of the stress in your life. You know, I think that after you work with them and they have confidence in the fact that you're not gonna leave them, that you wanna work with them, that might be an okay thing to say. In this case, if you notice all these really physical orthopedic things going on, you tell me, what, what do you think you could do here? Well, I mean, you said that strengthening, when she strengthened, it just made it worse. So I don't know what I would do besides the, what you were saying, breathing and supporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously great when she was strengthening before it wasn't working because nothing's holding her, right? So um, so here's what we did. We did, the workouts wouldn't have looked like workouts to everybody else, right? They were just looking at her body moving and I, she would come in, she was such a hard worker, um, is still, and we still connect um, probably once every couple of months now she's doing great, which is fantastic. But she, um, comes in and says, okay, I've been able to accomplish this. I can't seem to get and make any progress here. And I'll say, okay, show me what you're doing at home and show me what you're trying to get. And I just watch her move. That's all I do. I watch her move and I go, have you tried this? Or she'll give me ideas by watching me watching her move. Have you tried this? I see what's missing and I try and add it in. We do a lot with TheraBands. Um, it's interesting work um, because therabands stretch and they support kind of like ligaments. <laughs> so we do a lot with therabands. Um, and so basically I watch and I listen and then I give little tips. We, it was really exciting when she could do a baby swan. That was an amazing day. In fact, that was so exciting. She cried on that day. Like, the, those are the little things we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, we're trying to hold table talk without tension in the neck. We're trying to um, relax her shoulders and that rib of death while she moves her arms, like little tiny things we're trying to get and just finding ways to stabilize her, which these are all tools you guys have. So um, this is somebody like that who's really all over the place, I just try and settle them and focus on one thing. Stability in her case was the key, right? Somebody who can't get muscles active, somebody who can't, feels like her head's bobbling around. Um, you should think stability, right, in this case. So, um, but that's why I kind of said, take the time, 
listen, like really listen. What is she locking in? Um, think about it and take your time to think about it and then just watch. Say, show me what you've been doing at home. Show me what you can do. Show me what you can't do. Um, and then we try things together. And I, I can put my hands on her to guide her just like you would, right? You would put your hands on to help support her pelvis while her leg moves and just see if that changes anything. Or, you know, just simple things. And that's why I say don't really have an agenda because you don't know how it's gonna go that day. You just watch her, let them take the lead in this case. I know this is not an, a common scenario, but I just wanted to bring it up a bit more because these are the things that go undiagnosed, but these are the people who really need help. Um, the other thing I could do for her is tell her that you're not crazy, that there are things like these kinds of things that are hard to diagnose and that a lot of doctors don't know how to diagnose. Um, and then see if you can help, if you know anybody or you guys can always reach out to me if you have a client like this. I know now a pretty good network of people who can help with all of these types of things. Um, the only one maybe I don't know as well is the chronic fatigue. Um, but I, I know somebody who's a specialist with fibromyalgia. I know someone who does a lot of work with Ehlers-Danlos. I know somebody, people who do testing for Lyme disease. So I've, um, you can reach out and see if you can help them. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Oh, just uh, two questions. Did she get diagnosed by the x-ray and motion? And also, would you also consider thoracic outlet one of those um, syndromes that is hard to diagnose, that yeah. is like hard to, to pin, pinpoint, pin down? Yes, thoracic outlet is definitely one of those that not everybody will diagnose, although that's coming along. Um, so that's good. The Ehlers-Danlos, I still, um, I think it still goes undiagnosed much of the time. And I don't know if I have, I do have a doctor who recognizes it now. Um, you guys might've been, she came and spoke with us. Uh, Gloria Tucker was her name and she's up in Novato and also in North, I think she's Napa also, or I could be mistaken about that. She's Sonoma, Napa, somewhere North as well. Um, she is, she actually has Ehlers-Danlos herself and she's been able to really help diagnose and treat. She does prolotherapy and PRP. Also, she's been able to really help diagnose and treat a lot of the people that I'm working with, which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, I thoracic out is definitely one of those. I think um, they're just, people don't know what to do with them. So they don't diagnose it and they say, well, I don't know what to do with you. And so, yeah, go ahead, Anna. Just, um going back to the, the, this woman, would, would something like swimming where the water is supporting the body be a good yeah. thing? So it's a very, swimming is a very curious thing with somebody with hyper, any sort of hyper mobility dysfunction. Um, I would say it depends on the level of the dysfunction. I think for the most part, um, some, People who are severe, some of them feel like they have no control in the water, none. There's no gravity to hold them together. Um, but I do have a client who is really severe and she only feels okay in the water, but she can't swim. So she can walk in the water. We use the water for resistance exercises because she can't use a TheraBand, she can't use weights. She can't, and so she gets in the pool and she holds on to the edge and she marches in the pool and she tries to kick a leg back and she tries to move her arms back against the resistance of the water. Um, so, so sometimes I think swimming laps wouldn't be a thing, but I think sometimes it can be helpful if they're in a lot of pain and they need to unload a little bit, but otherwise I think they feel like they lose control in the water. There's not enough gravity. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. So she had worked, she had done physical therapy for 10 years before coming on to you off. on mm -hmm. and off. What was, what was the problem with their approach? If, if this sort of 
strengthening was the the and stabilizing was the goal what kind of didn't work yeah she couldn't hold the alignment so she could get through the motion but never activating the right muscles because her joints were not in the right place when she was doing the work mm -hmm. right? and i think um so if you're you guys might know might be easier to kind of relate with either a rotator cuff or with a pelvis, right? If the pelvis is not in alignment um, and you strengthen it there, you're not gonna really get much pain relief or really good strengthening because you're not able to access the right muscles if you're not in the right alignment. This, the rotator cuff, if the shoulder's falling below, kind of falling out of its position and you go to try and strengthen the rotator cuff, it's gonna instead create friction and discomfort. It's not gonna be now, ideally you strengthen rotator cuff and the shoulder comes back into position, right? But she couldn't do, she wasn't doing, none of it was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then people would go in and try and release this rib manually. And that would just set everything off as a flare because as soon as the rib cage moved, it, it wouldn't be just one rib. It would be like everything. People mm -hmm. who are hypermobile, like I had one client, I talked to this other physical therapist. She went to see another physical therapist um and she the physical therapist saw that her pelvis was not aligned right and you can't do any work that's open chain with people who are really hypermobile so everything has to be a closed chain so like no feet and straps they'd have to be feet on foot bar for example um so that you close the chain you can't have legs and arms in the air and, and she did it a little Correction. Also, if you're going to correct anything as a therapist with them, you have to have them do the correction. You can't correct their body without their help, muscular help, because it won't work. It will pull the joints out of place. It's too much. And so she, this physical therapist who's really experienced had met the client only a couple of times and decided she wanted to help her and correct her alignment and did the correction herself instead of having the client work through the correction. And the client couldn't move the next day, you know, and it was so such a light thing. And I talked to her, she's like, I am so, I feel so terrible. I've worked with a lot of people who are hypermobile before. And I said, I know this is a special case. Um, and she really wants to be able to work with you. So I just, she just asked me to talk to you. <laughs> you know, it was just one of those things. Um, so closed chain, um, Activities only for somebody who's super hypermobile. Yeah. Go ahead, Anna. Just just a little offshoot for a moment, if it's okay, of of just just curious. I always consider myself hypermobile, but um, and I I whenever I've seen people or had and you've seen me quite a bit, so I'm just curious about your perspective on me personally and in, in that kind of extreme to not so extreme, but also that whenever I would be worked on, people would always say, oh, you, um, you respond so quickly. Um, and whether that's actually a positive with a hypermobile person, um, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that I just kind of like everything goes all over and I very reactive um, mm -hmm. because I'm so hypermobile or am I not that hypermobile? Um, mm -hmm. just, just curious because I, I find it interesting that mm -hmm. idea of the the hypermobile person needing to be involved in the realignment. Yeah, I think if we're if we enter the world of hypermobility at all, that's my approach. Generally, is that I need to involve them. In fact, that's really become my approach more often than not with everybody because I feel like it's more effective uh, for most people. Now, I, I do work on people's bodies and do corrections myself when they're really stuck. Um, in particular situations, but uh, as far as your personal, I think there's a huge range and we can talk about, like you're definitely hypermobile, but you're nowhere on that, you're nowhere near the spectrum that we're talking about here. So, um, and you have strength in your body. Now, if we take all your strength away, I don't know what would happen, right? We might end up, you might end up accelerating up higher levels on that spectrum just because you don't have strength, but that's never going to be the case on it. <laughs> so um, anything we're going to work through those injuries quickly and you're just going to get back to strength. 
So, but I, but I think there is, so these are people whose skull is moving because their fissures haven't held together. Um, so they're, sometimes their jaws moving and their skulls moving. And so these are this extreme. It's not that common, but it's, I don't know, maybe I get to see more of them because they tend to come, uh, I tend to be a last resort person, but um, also I listen to people. So I think a lot of people don't take the time, but I think um, there is a huge spectrum here. And, and in any of those situations, these, these same things, really watching what they look like when they move gives you a lot of information. Um, and, and then you can know the next steps. If somebody is, the doctors think they're crazy, the best thing you can do is reassure her that she's not crazy. If you see something, if you see something physical or if you don't see something physical, they're not crazy. They're not making it up. What they're feeling is what they're feeling. And I think that's really important, but you can look and say, you know, this looks really orthopedic or this doesn't look orthopedic, very orthopedic. There's, and I think then, then you know what kind of conversation to have with the client. Um, and I think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go um, ahead. No, no, please. Just the fatigue thing I was going back to again and how my brain went to neurological with what we've been going through the brain body connection, not happening. I thought a neuro neurological and I never thought of um, hypermobility is the fatigue aspect because there's, it's so difficult to stabilize that they fatigue, like everything yeah. in the kitchen sink is trying to help and they fatigue because I never thought of fatigue and hypermobility. Yeah. So if you think about somebody who's really, um, and maybe I should have said physical fatigue. I mean, it's mentally ta taxing because of the emotional mental component of it, but physically fatiguing uh, is because why, why is she so physically fatigued? Do you think I'm going to throw it back at you guys? Why is she so physically fatigued? Because everything doesn't she have to work for every position that she's yes. in? Yeah, she has to. There has to be muscle work happening for every little thing that we don't have to work for. Not to that extent, anyway. Yeah. So she's physically exhausted because she's muscularly working to hold herself together, which is kind of sad, which is why there's nothing left to do anything else. Yeah. Go ahead, Lorraine. Yeah. Um, I missed the, the name of that diagnosis. Can you say it slowly? Yeah. Ehlers, E-L-H-E-R-S hyphen Danlos, D-A-N-L-O-S. Okay. Yeah, uh, so it's a hypermobility. We should, I should, um, we should have another conversation about it, just have a whole section on it. If you guys are interested on hypermobility and Ehlers-Danlos, um, it's, I think it's a super interesting topic and I think it's really underserved. Um, so we can definitely have a whole session on it at some point. And yeah. the other question I had was, um, what does it look like to have somebody align themselves as opposed to not? Like, does that mean not using props to wedges? Oh, good question. And... Yeah, good question. I think so in a physical without any sort of um, physical therapy or manual approach to it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to look. So, for example, I could put her in hook line. And her pelvis could be off, her knees could be different heights. Their feet could one be in front of the other. So what I could do with that is just work on holding that position, which hook lying is pretty supported, right? Laying on your back flat, knees are bent, feet are on the table and seeing if she can just, like maybe she says, okay, I feel one side of my pelvis down. I don't feel the other side. Maybe just say, saying to her, okay, let's do a three second hold and try and lower the other side of your pelvis in that position, not moving, rather than having somebody go in, like do, I, I, this is not, I don't feel like people with hypermobility should really be getting any massages, um, unless the person who is massaging them really understands exactly what's going on and what they need to release and what they need to leave tight. So this, this person might also 
come to you after a massage, which I've seen multiple times. I've had clients who I'm like, and this one woman in her seventies who would go away on trips and always like go to a spa and get a massage and come back injured. I'm like, when are you going to stop doing this to yourself? She was like, I know, but it's so nice as part of like the spa package to get a massage. I'm like, three times, four times, how many times are we going to do this? <laughs> you know? She's just too hypermobile in her pelvis. She couldn't get a massage and not get injured. So um, these are people where I would have her lay in hook line working on, okay, can you get some pressure on the other side of the pelvis? Can you slide your foot back to line it up with your other? Can you shift your body? Let's play with shifting your body to get your knees level on the foot bar maybe for footwork. Can we get you to push evenly on with both legs? If we can't get you to push evenly on both legs, can I get you to line up properly on one leg, at least one line through your body or one line through your other side of your body? What happens when we try and put that together? Yeah, can you go in quadruped and hold your neck in a neutral position? Right, these are the things we work on. And those things are gonna correct this body because I'm not doing it, she's doing it. All I'm doing is saying, nope, head needs to go a little bit longer and I don't put them there. I just say, you know, I just touch and say in this direction, you know, kind of like in this direction, maybe touch, touch rubbing in the direction I want them to go. I'm not doing it. I'm just suggesting it right um, in this direction or, oh, look, when your arms are up, we've got one shoulder here and one shoulder here. What if we try, what if you try and set both your shoulder blades down? Okay, now you can do that easily. What if you're holding a TheraBand? Can you do that with the resistance of like a TheraBand around the back of you? Can you do that with the resistance of a TheraBand? Can you hold your legs in tabletop and have equal pressure in your pelvis? Can you hold a ball between your knees? Right, those are the things that we work on. Not a lot, but these are all things that, that we're working towards alignment, right? Super simple. It looks like we're not doing anything. People walk walk around in the room and they're like, why are they just laying there on the floor? We laid, we had her laying on her on the floor on her belly, Superman, I don't know, for half an hour one day, just trying to get a shoulder blade to move or not move, or trying to get one leg to lift or the other leg to lift, you know, so just really small things. Yeah. All, all around stability. Although we should have a separate talk about that. I think this one, I wanted to throw this in here, knowing that it's super complex, knowing that hopefully it's not gonna be something that you're uh, one and only working with this person. This person needs to find the right resources, somebody who can um, really believe in her, really help her get through. And, and there's two things that really helped her, are helping her now. She's actually doing prolotherapy now with this Dr. Novato actually. And it seems to be really helping, which I'm very, very excited about for her. It's not magic, right? It's not miracle, miraculous, but it's giving her a little bit more stability and she's working hard to try and get, get better and better. The other thing with Ehlers-Danlos is that people often have this, what they call a mast cell activation, um, which is basically an allergic reaction, an allergic response. Um, it causes, sometimes causes rashes, sometimes uh, causes these huge flare-ups in their bodies where they get really lax and really uncomfortable. And, and so taking some antihistamine type medication or not even the antihistamines now they have like, she takes Allegra, which is a, an allergy pill has changed her world because she doesn't have these activations anymore, which were actually causing her body to go into this hypersensitive state and causing things to get worse. So, I mean, getting to a doctor who can understand, the, those doctors understand all these pieces of the um, situation that she's in and can help her. So there's things that don't seem related. So this is where like writing down, huh, client said she went out to dinner, she felt really sick and then her body fell apart. Like that's a, that's a red flag. We don't often think about like, allergy response and body connection. But in all of these, Lyme disease is like that. Fibromyalgia is like that. If they eat the wrong thing, they get worse. Um, so Ehlers-Danlos is like that. So those are, are kind of red flags as to something bigger going on that's out of our league, really. 
but that's why they'll listen again and trying just to think through and connect the dots. And maybe they would say something that doesn't resonate. Like they might say, I went out to dinner and the next day we felt really bad. And, but then they say a, a couple of weeks later, you know, we went out to dinner again and I got so sick again. Huh, that's kind of interesting. Or I had, um, we went out for this hike or walk and there was this cut grass and I started having a really allergy response. And the next day my bobble head started really bothering me again. But those are allergic resp responses to, to food or to an external that are causing physical changes. So that should alert something bigger um, to, to something else going on. So, you know, finding, again, listening, finding and telling them it's okay to go get another opinion. And luckily her husband, her husband who didn't know anything what to do with her, he was willing to, like I sent her home and said, have him do these tests for your neck. Um, have him do, you know, can, can he check this for you? Can we go, can we go get another x-ray? Can he recommend somebody who can get you? Like we just went to really specific things, one little piece at a time, right? So, Let's get you to a spine doctor who'll actually take an image of your spine while you're moving because that exists, right? I know it's challenging, but what, what I think is you guys can really do this and you can do it because you'll take the time and you'll listen and you'll watch and then you'll start asking questions, right? <laughs> and we will have, we can have another talk on Ehlers Dan Lowe, but yeah. I've kept you too long. <laughs> we got carried away.